So today in computational finance applied mathematical finance and its object oriented implementation, I like to continue discussing the calibration of our term structure model. But the main focus is today on the correlation structure. And what we will do today is really not related then to the interest rate model. It's a bit universal. It's to some extent, how do we generate correlated Brownian motions? And although maybe that if you think now back here to our interest rate term structure model, the correlation is maybe not the most important parameter. I mean, really important parameter is the volatility because it will create the fit to uh, options. And you already saw that given a correlation structure, we can use the volatility to fit all swaption products. So that's a very powerful parameter. So maybe correlation is not the most important parameter, but um, creating correlated, yeah, so Brownian motions. So Brownian motion with an instantaneous correlation is an important part of the model and maybe of many models. So that's a bit universal today. And also um, there are a lot of subtle aspects. Yeah. So I have a really a collection of remarks that are quite important because this is really also related to numerical errors, numerical stability, and also understanding uh, what a correlation structure actually implies uh, for our model. So this is really about getting the right intuition for the model. We are in the section on calibration. We already looked at initial condition and volatility, had some numerical experiments. And I like to talk about the correlation, more specifically, the factor decomposition and factor reduction. So to some extent, it's even independent of the problem of calibration. So first, factor decomposition. So we consider the model, well, equation number 100. Okay, that was our term structure model in this form. Okay, and there was here the Brownian increment. And you see that every forward rate here, I had its own Brownian increment. So every model primitive quantity had its own Brownian increment. And then we specified here some instantaneous, yeah, so infinitesimal uh, correlation. So that was our correlation model. And we had an alternative form for our model. So that's here the number 100 star, where we actually did not express the dynamic in terms of these correlated Brownian increments. So these guys, dw here. Well, we used independent factors, the duk. Yeah, so the duk are independent Brownian increments. So dui, dul is zero if i is not equal to l and it's uh, dt if the two indices are equal. So we used that and then had here some uh, factor loadings in front. Yeah. And <clears throat> this uh, factor loading, the lambda ik is actually the product of the sigma i and then comes some f i k and yeah, if you now perform the scalar product of d w with d w transposed or if you just multiply the d w i with d w j then you see that your correlation is actually the scalar product of these factors yeah so the f i row vector and the fj row vector. So we already had this alternative representations here with these factor loadings f. Uh, so if you separate volatility from the correlation, uh, then it's a factor loading f. 
And we saw here, so the section was efficient implementation for the drift, that if we have, so efficient here was a little bit related to the M. If we have here a small number of these factors, then the calculation of the drift is much faster. I will come back to this later when I talk about factor reduction. But first, the question, how do I calculate these uh, factors FIK? Yeah? So if I have FIK, then of course, it's clear how to get lambda, yeah? just multiply with the correlation uh, parameter. So given a correlation matrix R, how do I determine these factors FIK that we can use the alternative form, the alternative form where we create the Brownian increments DW, well, the correlated ones, DWI, uh, from independent Brownian increments DU, uh, DUK. Uh, I discussed this here for the infinitesimal increments. So you see there's a here a D in front. But of course, um, what comes next also holds for the Brownian increment that appears in the Euler scheme. Yeah, it's just a, a constant coefficient. Yeah, and then you just in, integrate the du to get a delta u and the dw to get a delta w, and everything, the equations are just the same. Maybe you can just write it down for random variables, yeah, for arbitrary random variables. Uh, so the derivation is, is just the same. So here is how it works. Given a correlation matrix, so we start with some correlation matrix R. Yeah? So here I label the indices uh, I, J from one to N. Uh, if you think back of our model of the forward rates, the forward rates were associated with a time discretization time discretization from T0 to Tn, and the forward rates were labeled from i equals 0 to i equals n minus 1. So <clears throat> the indices are maybe yeah, shifted by 1. Uh, yeah, but that's that's uh, not an issue. Yeah? OK, so I label here my correlation matrix R, rho ij. Uh, it's an n by n matrix. So this is my correlation matrix. Of course, the correlation matrix is symmetric. Yeah, that's trivial. Uh, but the correlation matrix is also positive semi-definite. And maybe that's not immediately clear why that is the case. OK, so maybe just remark this here. OK, why is this the case? Yeah, so maybe we need some kind of proof for this. Um, if the correlation matrix is symmetric, then I know that it has only real eigenvalues. Yeah, it's self-adjoint, yeah, so it's easy to see that this means that it has only real eigenvalues. If it is positive semi-definite, it means that all my real eigenvalues are larger than zero. So from this uh, symmetry, I know that I can find an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Uh, so that's also now related to this symmetry. So I can find an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Let's call these guys V1 to Vn. That, given that setup, you know that you can, well, go to the basis yeah, that is represented by these eigenvectors. And under this basis, the um, correlation matrix looks like a diagonal matrix. So in other words, you know that there exists um, the V, this is my basis transformation, such that V transposed R V is a diagonal matrix. Well, um, the V is an orthonormal basis. So you know that V transposed is actually the inverse. Yeah. So if I multiply two vectors, yeah, it's either the norm, which is one, or it's zero if the two vectors are different because they are orthogonal. So I have that column times column is 
rho of the transpose times column. So I have that V transpose V is the identity. And from that, you see that you have R can be represented as V times D times V transpose. Yeah? So just uh, multiply with V from the left and with V from V transpose from the right, this equation. So I get a representation of, of R. Yeah, okay, that's nice. Yeah? So we have that R is V D V transpose. So now my eigenvalues on the diagonal are all positive or not negative. So I can take the square root. So I can actually write here VD square root of the diagonal, V square root of the diagonal matrix times square root of the diagonal matrix times V transposed. And that's actually the same as V square root of the diagonal matrix times V square root of the diagonal matrix transposed. Okay, well, because transposed, you flip the multiplication and the transposed of the diagonal matrix is the diagonal matrix. So I have a decomposition of um, the matrix R into maybe two factors F times F transposed. So that's this guy here is now a matrix F. And I can now use this matrix F to define or create the DW, the correlated Brownian increment from the DU. So the claim is if U1 to UN now denote independent Brownian motions, then if I define here DW by F times DU, so the F is the V square root of D, DU, then uh, my DW is an N dimensional Brownian motion with this correlation structure, yeah? so the given correlation structure. So we define our factor matrix F in this form. So all we need is some algorithm that performs an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition of the correlation matrix. And we have found the factors FIK, yeah? because the factors FIK are now the elements of this matrix here. So let's uh, prove this result. Well, I just need a little proof for maybe this part here. Yeah, um, All the other stuff is maybe just already here on the slide. So obviously the correlation matrix is symmetric. That's trivial. Um, so all the eigenvalues are real. So we already had that. And it's also positive semi-definite. Okay, how do we see that? So if R is a correlation matrix, say for example, or a random variable vector X, so X should be have uh, should have variance one and expectation zero. So then the uh, covariance matrix yeah, or the variance matrix, that is the expectation of X times X transposed is already the correlation. So now if VI denotes such an eigenvector, yeah, so I can look then at X transposed VI squared. Huh? Okay, and you know, this is uh, positive. Okay, so what's that? Uh, that's the scalar product of X transposed VI with itself. Huh? So that's VI transposed times X times VI. Okay, but now you see from my definition, this here is together with the expectation, the correlation matrix R, V is just a, um, a constant uh, vector. Yeah? So that's just VI transposed RVI 
Now vi was an, an eigenvector. So this part here is lambda i v i. So I have that this is lambda i v i squared. And you see now if you divide by the norm of the vector that the matrix has only non-negative real eigenvalues and the dw is well defined. Now you can maybe add here to the proof, you know, the line that this choice here is given us the right result. So we have that the correlation matrix R times dt. Well, that's actually dw times dw transposed. Uh, so dw transposed is now a row vector. dw is a column vector. Row times column is the element dwi multiplied with the element dwj. Yeah, so this here is the matrix row ij dt. Okay, so just in, in vector notation. Now you plug in the definition. So I have that this is v square root of the diagonal du, this is the dw, multiplied with the transposed, so this is du transposed, square root of the diagonal, transposed, okay, doesn't matter, v transposed. Okay, you see that this here is just the identity matrix because these are independent Brownian increments from my assumption. So this is here the identity and you have that this is V, D, V transposed. Yeah, this is R. Okay, so that here was the question. Yeah, and yes, we checked that this is true. <clears throat> okay, so I have the rule how to create uh, these correlated Brownian motions, these factors F. This is now an opportunity to introduce um, another thing, the factor reduction. And I already mentioned that there is a motivation to use a correlation matrix that has a small rank. Yeah. So because if you go back to your definition, you see that the matrix F here is defined by the column that is the eigenvector multiplied with the square root of the eigenvalue. But if an eigenvalue is zero, because the matrix has a smaller rank, then actually these guys here will be just columns that have zero. And if we go back to the definition here of our model in this form, it means that actually this sum here doesn't need to run to up to n. It just needs to run, uh, run up to m because the fik for k larger than m, these are the columns, are zero. So actually this here is some kind of truncation that can be performed if the matrix has a rank that it's smaller than n or so. And we have a motivation to have a small rank because then the calculation of the drift, yeah, you remember this efficient calculation of the drift can be performed significantly faster. So apart from that, there are other motivations to have a correlation matrix with small rank. Yeah? You saw there is some, the factor loadings times DUI. So this, rank also determines how many random numbers do we have to generate. Yeah? So if there is a du1, du2, I have to generate two random numbers, two independent random numbers for the du's. Now if there is just a du1, I just have to generate one yeah, for every step. So that's also scaling linear here. Yeah? The effort to generate random numbers scales linear in the rank of the correlation matrix. And a third argument, if you use many DUs, you are actually generating a random vector in high dimension. And you maybe remember that random number generators, they become poorer in high dimension. So if you need to generate 
a random vector in higher dimension that is really degrading a little bit the quality of your, your sampling. So you see there are many, actually here on the slide, three different motivations, while I would prefer to have a correlation matrix of small rank. But then if you think back to how we specified the correlation, when I talked here about calibration, I mentioned that sometimes you just specify the correlation in terms of such a simple model, a simple model where correlation just depends on the distance, uh, but it's absolutely not obvious if this matrix here has a small rank. Actually, in most cases, it has full rank. Full rank, but with a lot of, uh, well, not so important stuff. Okay, so we like to do now the following. Given a correlation matrix, can we use the previous factor decomposition to reduce the rank of the correlation matrix by throwing away stuff that is maybe not so important? So this is the factor reduction. So we use the construction of the Brownian motion that we have just discussed. Also, this means that we have the factor matrix F, where the columns are just the eigenvectors multiplied with the square root of the eigenvalues. And now we just do the following. We define a reduced factor matrix. So this is here the factor matrix, okay, we do some kind of reduction. This is the reduced factor matrix where we just run for K from one to M. So we just use the first M columns. So this matrix here is an N by M matrix. This matrix on top is an N by N matrix. And obviously the rank of this matrix can be at most M. Huh? So I have already reduced the rank. And with that reduced matrix, I now defined my Brownian motion by saying DW is F reduced, FR, F superscript R times DU. So this means that here the DU is now M vector. And you have row of M elements with the column of this M vector. And you have N rows given you the N vector of the Brownian increments. So well, in this representation with the sum, yeah, sum uh, lambda I, K, T, U, K. Yeah? So that means that in the sum, you have now columns of zero. You just drop a few terms. Yeah? So dropping these columns. Uh, okay, so dropping the columns uh, is not admissible. That's not uh, what, what we are allowed to do. We have to do a small modification. Uh, I will explain that on the next slide, but just have the formula here. I need to renormalize the row with the norm of this reduced, this cutoff matrix. Yeah? So what's the point here? This will lead to Fik of this reduced matrix multiplied with Fik of this reduced matrix is equal to one. Yeah? Because first I had that row I with row I of the matrix F, the not reduced one, uh, is the correlation rho ii is equal to one. So I had that all rows had, had norm one because it is a correlation matrix. And so um, the norm has to be one because the correlation matrix has one on the diagonal. And if you just cut off a few columns, then of course you lose some, you lose some variance yeah, in, in, in this. Yeah, and uh, the correlation of the random variable with itself is no longer one. Yeah? So you have to do this renormalization. 
Well, uh, are we throwing away important stuff? And that was maybe not so obvious, but on the previous slide, and I would like to have the same setup as on uh, here our lemma, the eigenvalues were ordered. So the larger ones were the first column. Yeah? So you see you multiply here with square root of lambda one, and then you multiply here with square root of lambda n. So the larger columns come first. So by throwing away the last columns, the columns m plus one to n, I'm actually throwing away the columns that have a low weight. Yeah? These here are all normalized vectors. So they just define a kind of direction in which direction is the movement. And this here defines how strong is the movement. So at this point um, that we throw away the columns from m plus one to n. So we leave out the columns with small eigenvectors, uh, eigenvalues, sorry. So we leave out columns with small lambda k. So this is just a principal component analysis followed. Yeah, so we just look at the principal components, the M main drivers, followed by some renormalization to make it um, a correlation matrix again. Okay, to just repeat this and illustrate this, uh, we have our correlation matrix R. The correlation matrix R will then give us the matrix F. Well, the matrix F, I have here vectors. Okay, F, I, K. So the I is actually the column and the K is then, uh, sorry, the K is the column. The I is actually the row. Um, so I have F dot one to F dot N. Yeah, if you like to consider these guys here as vectors. Yeah, and you have some stuff here in this matrix. Well, this is uh, associated with the lambdas. Yeah, each column is associated with a lambda. So this is the N here. Um, then what we do is we cut off a certain part. So we just go to F I M. Okay, we cut off a certain part. And then we had the condition that if I calculate this row here with this row, if I if I multiply the two rows here, then this is the correlation. So this here is the correlation. This is the row i j. Yeah, this is the correlation. So you also have the constraint that the norm of each row is one. So you get the factor reduced matrix where you just have here the fraction of that row and you renormalize this. Yeah? So renormalized. Such that the row has norm one. Okay, so that's the main idea of this uh, factor reduction. Uh, very nice. And we throw away the unimportant stuff because we have this ordering. So, Small summary, small uh, interpretation. The magnitude yeah, of the eigenvalue, this represents a little bit the importance of the corresponding factor. So um, by throwing away the guys that are um, small, we are actually throwing away the guys that are not so important. So let's have a look uh, at how this 
looks like. So here on the left, I have the matrix F. So actually the picture is rotated. Uh, what I have here is the matrix F transposed. Uh, so now the factors are not in the columns, the factors are in uh, the rows. So this means this here is the F dot one. No, so the row. So this means, for example, this point here is F25 one, uh, because there's the 25 here. It's the factor that is multiplied to the random variable delta U1. So this guy is multiplied to delta U1. or infinitesimal, the du1. So a random number on du1 multiplied with this number defines the dw, uh, one part of it, of the dw25. Uh, so this guy here is the movement applied to the 25th if we speak of forward rates or here uh, for historical reason, LIBOR rates, uh, the 25th forward rate gets this movement. And you see that um, this factor actually moves all the guys here in almost in parallel. Yeah? So you can see, think of this red line now as a shape of a movement. Yeah? So when you have some random number that goes up, it will say that all the rates go up. So this here is then the green one is my factor, my second factor, it's the F. Okay, that is a dot here, two. Uh, so the dot is just because I have many components of my vector. So that's the second uh, factor. And this is the guy that is multiplied to the du2. So a second random number is generated and then it defines that amount of movement in this direction. And the direction is that now rates on the one side are moving up, but rates on the other side are moving down. If du2 is positive, it will move rates on one side up and rates on the other side go down. Okay, so it is, this is an, the shape of the curve. Yeah. And this here is then the random number that modifies the uh, magnitude. And you also see that now the shapes have different scalings. Yeah. So you see that this guy here is already very close to 100%, while that guy here is maybe an average, something like plus 50% or minus 50%. And that shape is how much we multiplied with the eigenvalue. So having a small eigenvalue means that we have something oscillating here with a small amplitude. So the lambda corresponds to the amplitude. Actually, maybe square root of lambda, okay. It's just uh, a correspondence. Then factor reduction means that we go from left to right, and we have the matrix F reduced, where we have reduced, where we have dropped some columns. Well, I, uh, I already mentioned that the picture is rotated, so that's here F reduced transposed. So I removed some rows. Removing some rows is removing some of these lines. So I just remove some of the lines and I remove the guys that have a small amplitude, a small uh, eigenvalue. Uh, and then you see that the shape of the red curve is not exactly the same. Yeah, there's a small 
turning point here suddenly, yeah, that wasn't on the left-hand side. And that's due to the renormalization. Yeah? So we have, we have dropped some amplitudes, some variance, and we have to redistribute this part to the other guys. So the renormalization is now in the column here. So we do a renormalization such that the sum of the squares of these points equals to one, okay? So the sum of this squared is one. So this is our renormalization that we have performed. And you see there's a slight change uh, in, the, in the shape. If you have a very high eigenvalues also on the other uh, factors, then the picture could look like this. You see, you have large amplitudes here inside. And then of course you remove maybe important factors. And you also see that the change here on the shape is a little bit more significant. Here, the amplitude of this red factor is 25% approximately. And now it has increased to up to 50% uh, because we have removed so much variance from or so much uh, movement from the other factors. So you have to be a little bit careful. This correlation structure here maybe requires more factors, uh, a, higher, a higher rank. So if you look at the last picture, uh, at the last case um, again, and you now plot the correlation ma matrix. So this here is now the correlation matrix R. Yeah? So these points here are the row IJ. Um, so the row IJ here in color. Yeah. So you view it maybe from the top. So this here is then uh, the I and the J, if you like. Um, or the other way around. So this here is the I and the J. Uh, then if you now perform the factor reduction and you just calculate again, the reduced F reduced F reduced transposed. Yeah? So the reduced matrix, you see that the correlation matrix is a bit, yeah, away from the original one. Yeah? So maybe you have thrown away uh, too much uh, information, but still uh, you have some, some uh, properties. Yeah? It, uh, you have some kind of decay here in this uh, direction. You also have this decay in this direction, but you cannot represent it precisely. Okay, so maybe we can uh, play a little bit with this. I have a small uh, toy. I use here our correlation model that we already had before. So correlation model here now refers to this functional form. And I would like to uh, view now, how do the factors uh, impact uh, or the factor reduction impact this correlation matrix? So if you like to do this um, at home, you can uh, check out this code here. There is a little toy in this uh, repository, uh, which you actually can run using, using the Maven execute uh, command. So let's just do this. So if you not already have it, you can just check out this repository, FinMath experiments from GitHub. Then let's enter into the directory and Let's run this command. Okay, and then a small toy will start where you can specify this correlation model. Okay, so I can specify here the correlation model exponential minus a number times the distance of the, in our interpretation, forward rates on the uh, interest rate curve discretization. So TI minus TJ. 
Okay, let's start with the model e to the minus zero. So that's actually the correlation matrix where every entry is one. Okay, so when every entry is one, the matrix has, uh, yeah, correlation here you see is always one. The matrix has rank one. It has one eigenvector, yeah, one, 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 one is an eigenvector. The eigenvalue is n. If you multiply this, yeah, you get just n. And the remaining ones are just zero yeah? because the n minus one dimensional orthogonal space yeah, um, are, is the space of the eigenvectors belonging to the eigenvalue zero. So you see that I have one factor and that factor is one. And also now in the interpretation, dw equals sum of fik duk, you see there's only the f1k, the first factor, it's always one. So every dwi is equal to du1. Everyone gets the same movement. So that's nice. Um, then maybe let's increase a little bit here the correlation structure. So I have a 0 0.1, yeah, so a 1%. And you see that I have here a decay. So this is a correlation decay parameter. Maybe you don't see it here very well in the colors, but here it becomes a little bit lighter to the end. Okay, so you see there is still the parallel movement very dominant, but not completely 100%. And there is another factor popping up, the movement where the curve is tilting. Okay. And uh, yeah, here it looks as if you can safely just remove uh, many factors. Okay, how many factors do we have? Okay, it's actually 100, 100 components, 100 times 100 matrix. So I'm safely remove, removing 95 factors. Okay, that's a, a huge improvement. And correlation matrix, okay, it looks similar. Yeah, the factors, you get the big one, which is the tilt, uh, the second one, which is the bending. Maybe I increase this figure here. Let's have an 0.05, oh, okay. So you see the decay is increasing. You have here exponential decay. It always, oh, it goes maybe down to say 20% here. And you have more amplitudes, more frequencies popping up. And in the factor reduction, you see that it's not so sharp. Yeah, here's there some wiggling, but the matrix still uh, looks uh, similar. Uh, so if you make this larger and larger, you see that more and more important other factors come in. So, but still using five factors gives you a correlation matrix that is similar. Uh, and the first five factors, they also look very similar. Okay, the factors have interpretation. You know, the red one is a level, the green one is some kind of tilting and the first blue one is some kind of bending in the middle. Um, so if you go even higher here, say a 50, uh, 0.5 in the decay, yeah, you see that we do not match the original shape and, but five factors is maybe already quite okay. But now if you make the factor reduction larger, yeah, you just have four factors, three factors, or two factors, you see that we move further and further away from the original correlation matrix. So maybe you can play a little bit with this little toy and get some intuition for how this works. So now I would like to conclude this with um, a few nice uh, remarks. And um, I already stated that our covariance or correlation is somewhat a model within a model. Huh? So we have our E2 process, which is the original model in under some measure, but we are still free to choose the correlation model. And we would like to choose the correlation model maybe in simple in simple ways, for example, one possible way was the functional form. 
So we just have a single parameter like in our example, alpha, and uh, we just specify, okay, this parameter specifies the decorrelation of uh, the elements in one, one nice parameter. But actually from that functional form, it's not immediately clear if this thing is a correlation matrix. So, so uh, you can immediately check that rho i i is equal to one because e to the zero is one. So that's okay. But maybe the matrix could exhibit negative um, eigenvalues. So it's not immediately clear if this is a correlation matrix. So we need to check that our specification doesn't accidentally create negative eigenvalues. And that's now easy. We just perform the factor decomposition where we determine the um, eigenvalues. And we could just choose a way of fixing this problem. And we could just throw away the negative eigenvalues you know, or add them as, po as positive ones. We could try to fix it in a certain way. The next remark is the numerical robustness. And if you go back to our little toy, you see that these in this in this flipped version, yeah. So these rows here are my eigen vectors multiplied with the eigenvalue. But if you have now the green one, then you could just multiply the green one with minus one and it would also be a solution. And you immediately see that flipping the vector, yeah, so multiplying it with minus one is the same model because it just means that you have the random number du in this part du2 because it is the second one, the green one, du2 has changed the sign. And the random uh, number, the Brownian increment is normally distributed, so it is uh, symmetric. Yeah, so if you draw the random number one or minus one, yeah, it doesn't matter if you, if you just flip the sign. So there is some non-uniqueness. So I said you determine eigenvectors, eigenvalues, but there is some uh, non-uniqueness. So we have the problem if vi is now a normed eigenvector, then minus vi is also a normed eigenvector. Actually, it should be vector here, right? And even worse, if you have a multiple eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue, uh, then you could use just any linear combination from the span, you know, from the subspace that belongs to this um, eigenvalue. So if you have a multiple eigenvalue. So it's maybe not unique how we specify the factors. And now if your numerical algorithm produces sometimes the plus and sometimes the minus one, this is maybe creating some noise and this is a problem then with respect to the numerical robustness. Yeah? It could happen that you do a, a small change yeah? and suddenly your model flips to another, um, another eigenvalue decomposition and that would re result in a small parameter change could flip your numerical error. So that I would like to avoid. So to avoid this, what I could do is just, I create some convention that makes this choice unique. So for example, with the sign, the convention could be that um, the first element, yeah, so the fi1 uh, should be uh, positive. And if you look back to our toy, that's also the convention that we do here. Yeah? So if you add now more factors, you see that all the guys always start here on the positive side. They're just the convention to make these guys unique. You can peek into the code, yeah, actually, if you like. So here you have the code for this. You see I have... Uh, here a package covariances and in the package covariances you find also a covariance model that is created from um, 
volatility and correlation. So that's here, a covariance model from volatility and correlation. And then you find a bunch of volatility models. These are the sigmas and you find a bunch of correlation models. There are just a few here. For example, that one is the one with the exponential decay. And um, that's not a big code. You find here the functional form and then you find the eigenvalue decomposition and then you find the renormalization. And if you peek into this eigenvalue decomposition, so you see there is this convention impl implemented here that checks uh, the first element of this eigenvector and ensures that I always get the, the same eigenvector. That's a subtle issue yeah, that could make your computer code instable, you know, that you have to create a uniqueness. There's another issue related to numerical robustness. And that's the following. It could happen that for a certain parameter, uh, for example, in my e to the minus alpha model, yeah, a certain parameter alpha results in a correlation matrix that has already a rank that is smaller than M. Well, you say maybe this is a rare case, but just think e to the minus alpha, if you choose alpha equals zero, the rank is collapsing to one. So that means that you would like to specify a model that has M factors. So I go up to M uh, random numbers in my random number vector here, but suddenly I have a reduced rank. I, I only need one, or in that case here, maybe the first R guys. And you have to be a little bit careful if you take now the random numbers from a random number sequence. So now taking the random numbers from a sequence as they are needed. Yeah? So that may lead now to different random numbers used. Yeah? Because if you then use in the second time step, you maybe use a different random number because you didn't use the random numbers from R plus one to two M. No? So because now the numbers, the random numbers I need suddenly change by just changing this parameter. So, and this is also an issue because it will suddenly flip your numerical error. In our case, it will flip to a different Monte Carlo approximation error. And you see that suddenly a small change in the parameter. So setting alpha from epsilon to zero will suddenly completely changed the Monte Carlo error. And that's, uh, uh, well, that, that's an issue. Sometimes you, you are debugging, okay, what is going on there? Yeah, a small change is suddenly uh, uh, leading to a huge change in the value. And you are searching searching for the error and it's just this, this behavior. Uh, for that reason, it's good to always generate the same lengthy random number vector we are doing this in our Brownian motion. We are always generating M factors, even if we do not use them. Next remark, you saw in our little toy that sometimes the matrix, the reduced matrix is not so close to the original one. So how close should the matrix be? So question, um, if we perform this factor reduction, we may be concerned that the reduced matrix is maybe not close to the original matrix. And if you forget about this renormalization, of course, the magnitude of the eigenvalues uh, give you uh, some indication of what you have thrown away. Yeah? You can define the norm in, term, in terms of these guys. So, but is this really a problem? And the surprising result is that maybe if we look at calibration, it's maybe not relevant if the two are close. Because I view the reduced matrix as my model. 
So my model is now the functional form plus the reduction. And then calibration is trying to determine the best fit reduced correlation matrix. So the best fit correlation matrix within the space of all reduced correlation matrices. So I'm, I'm fitting the best reduced matrix to my data. And if I'm doing that, I have the best reduced matrix and I do not care if that reduced matrix is close to the unreduced one because the unreduced one is not even maybe the optimal solution. So that's another nice issue, okay, or another nice thing that we, if we are in terms of calibration, maybe we don't have to care about this. The only thing that we have to care about is, are we using enough factors to represent what we see on, on the market? The last remark with respect to implementation, eigenvector decomposition, I use a singular value decomposition algorithm, but that's maybe uh, expensive. So the algorithm can be time consuming. Uh, and maybe you have to take a little bit care that your program doesn't become too slow to, uh, well, implementation techniques. Yeah, I would like to remind you of two implementation techniques here, uh, though the first one is caching. So if you have, for example, one correlation matrix R that does not depend on time, you will use this matrix in every time step. So you just pre-calculate the matrix F once and use it for every time step. And the second aspect is um, lazy initialization. So maybe I just do the uh, eigenvalue decomposition only when somebody is requesting these factors. So some of you maybe already know these two things. Yeah, you can also sometimes find these in, in the code and actually here in the code, we are also just caching. We are caching the generated factor matrix. Yeah, we are here initializing. We are here initializing the factor matrix and then we store it we store it here as, 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 as a member. And whenever somebody is asking for the factors again, we just get the pre-calculated factors. Okay, so to conclude, this is the toy you can try. And here we had this uh, these pictures I already created with you. So this here is the one factor model. Yeah, this is just a single parallel movement. That's here my five factor model with higher decorrelation and even higher decorrelation. Yeah, so you also have this in the script and here you have the code in the script. Okay, so that was my session on the correlation.